The Batteries Included podcast is brought to you with United Chargers. United Chargers presents the Grizzly range of EV chargers. There's the original Grizzly Classic, a powerful, heavy-duty, portable EV charging station built to withstand the toughest conditions. The Grizzly Duo, a dual-port unit designed to charge two vehicles at the same time. The Grizzly Mini, a small, portable charging station built with an indoor-outdoor rated cast aluminium enclosure. And the Grizzly Smart, a revolutionary smart EV charger. All Grizzly chargers come with a convenient 24-foot cable and the ability to adjust the current from 16 amps all the way up to 40 amps. That's 9.6 kilowatts, plus the IP67 rated. Built in Canada with the highest quality materials, order yours now at unitedchargers.com. That's unitedchargers.com. Hello, and welcome to the Batteries Included podcast. It's March the 22nd, 2024. And this is episode number 29. Thank you very much for joining us. On today's show, we'll be talking about the debut of the Audi A6 e-tron, Rivian gaining access to the Tesla supercharger network, the highway range of four electric pickup trucks, and of course, much, much more. Uh, joining us today is the congenial Mr. Tom Logley, senior editor at Inside EVs and host of the YouTube channel, State of Charge. We also have the melodious Mr. Martin Lee from the EV News Daily Podcast, which is available on all the best podcast platforms. And of course, Kyle Connor joins us from the majestic, practically palatial halls of Unispec Studios, where he produces high voltage videos for a number of YouTube channels. I'm Dominic Yoni. Uh, hey there, everybody. Good to see you all. Hello. All mm. right. Um, so we don't have a news roundup for you this week, but we're going to be talking about some news. Um, but before we do, uh, let's see. The, so the big news of the week, I guess, it would be the debut of the Audi Q6 e-tron. But I thought we'd start first with maybe uh, news that affects us really more in the here and now, and that's the news that Rivian vehicles have now gained access to the Tesla supercharger network. So we saw a couple people managing to wrangle a charge like last Friday before the official announcement. Um, but then Tesla cottoned on and I think turned off that ability or something. But in any case, the, the day, uh, the official announcement happened Monday and now Rivian owners now have access to 15,000 compatible supercharger spots in the U S in addition to the 16,000 CCS chargers that are supposed to be out there for them. Uh, both Kyle and Tom have videos up covering on how this all works. And uh, so let's have them tell us how it works. <laughs> Kyle, let's start with you. Uh, what do Rivian owners need to do to charge at Tesla Supercharger? Well, there's two different kinds of superchargers. There's ones that are called Magic Docks that have the adapter built into it. Uh, and then there are those that require a third-party adapter uh, or, or a factory adapter, but Rivian's not providing a factory adapter at the moment to their customers. So Rivian owners in general gained nothing at the time of this recording uh, because Rivian has not shipped any official adapters out to their customers. Uh, my understanding is they had only a handful of early adapters to go around. Um, I have one now, so I have two of the official adapters. So one you're, from you're, Ford. You're, you're an early adapter adopter? <laughs> That's right, yeah. So I have you know, one that Ford sent us and one that Rivian sent us, uh, and we're actually going to take all the trucks on a little towing thing this weekend where we needed both adapters uh, so that both trucks can use the supercharger network. It's, um, yeah, uh, ultimately it's, it's as simple as when you find an approved station, which the Rivian knows which ones are compatible, which ones are incompatible, you roll up with your Rivian, plug the J3400 NAX connector into your adapter, and then that goes into your CCS port on the Rivian. Uh, the Rivian handles all the plug and charge communications, the billing. Um, the, the problem with that, though, is that when you use plug and charge for billing, you always pay the more expensive rate. It's like Ford and Electrify America have been for years with plug and charge. So no one uses plug and charge because uh, you can pay a lot less money just by swiping in the app, or in this case, pre-authorizing in the Tesla app to buy down a cheaper hmm. rate. You pay, I think, 12 bucks a month and you uh, significantly reduce your per kilowatt hour costs. And, uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, ultimately it's pretty simple. It's pretty easy. We've shown it in videos. Tom showed it, we've shown it. Same mm -hmm. process as Ford. You pull up, put the adapter in, plug in, walk away, not worry about it. And the only reason you would need to use the app is if you want the cheaper price. Right on. Um, Tom, uh, anything you'd like to say about that? 
Is there anything else that we missed? Because you both have videos. I don't know. Maybe we can share a little clip. Yeah. So following up on what Kyle talked about price wise, I've always told people, and people have asked me, should I, should I join uh, Tesla? You know, and pay the twelve dollars a month. You, you basically, if you think you're going to use the supercharger network at least once a month, it becomes worth it. Uh, but if you're not going to use it once a month, if you're going to use it on, you know, a, a occasional road trip every two months or every three months, and you think you might use it four or five times a year, you're probably better off just paying the higher rate at the pump and and not, um, you know, giving Tesla one hundred and fifty dollars, one hundred forty four dollars for the year. So that that you you have to decide what makes sense to to you as far as how much you're going to use it. Uh, and yeah, I, I actually just watched Kyle's video this morning. He covered pretty much everything. It's just so easy. You know, you just pull up and plug in and it works and you don't have to worry. Like I'm not even stressed. Like, you know, when I plug in, when I do the charge recordings, I'm like hanging on the uh, Electrify America EVgo charger, waiting, making sure it connects, making sure I'm not missing something. And I just felt like every time I go to the supercharger, I just, I don't have any anxiety. You know, it's mm. just like, I just plug it in and it just starts working, you know, and uh, that's that's really where we need to be for mass adoption on electric vehicles. The public charging infrastructure, I think, has really held back um, EV sales to this point. And a lot of it is around that worry and concern and bad experiences. And hopefully um, this will um, give people good experiences, A and B, really force the other networks just kick them in the ass to get this done and working better. Um, otherwise, people just won't use the stations. I'm going to go on a, uh, God, it's almost four, uh, it's a 400 mile trip, a little bit, no, actually 425 or something like that uh, the, on, on Monday up uh, to uh, way up in Massachusetts. And uh, I'm going to take my Rivian and um, uh, it's interesting because now I have options. I, I'm going to have to stop along the way. And uh, I'm I'm probably just not even going to consider using another network, and that's crazy, you know. Uh, so um, yeah, I, I have the video that came out in the Rivian. I'm also, as you guys know, I've been doing a lot of adapter videos. We're probably going to talk about that a little later. On uh, uh, you know, touch really because of what Kyle mentioned about uh, the scarcity of these the official Tesla adapter. It's going to be a huge problem. There are people that have Rivians now that are not going to get their adapter until like November or December. It's going to take a long time. This isn't going to be two or three months and people don't want to wait. So, um, you know, we'll talk about that probably later in, in the video. I have all the adapters here, the uh, official Tesla adapter, the Electron adapter and the A to Z adapter. And that's not all the adapters. There's other companies making them, but I've decided to only really talk about and do thorough reviews of these two uh, because I know they come from companies that have a history of making relatively good quality adapters that I haven't had any problems with and I, even my followers haven't. Um, and uh, I know that, you know, if, if Tesla had a million of these right now, day one, it really, we wouldn't be talking too much about these third party adapters, but people are going to buy them. Regardless, it doesn't matter. They're against terms of use from Rivian and Ford and and, and Tesla. People are going to buy them. So I think it, it it benefits the community if I try to figure out which ones are the ones that, you know, I, I would use. And if if I were forced to use a non-approved adapter. Okay. Uh, so just, just a little bit about the experience, just for a second, just so I, I'm really clear. So when you're navigating somewhere in the Rivian, does the superchargers like populate the screen like like all the other ones? So you have to filter for them. Yeah, they all they all populate, even the ones you can't use. But it okay. tells you you can't go, you can't use this one, okay. which is really also cool. Hide incompatible ones. Yeah, you okay. yeah you, you well you can filter that right, Kyle. Yeah, yeah I, can, I, I I haven't shown all of them. Yeah, yeah. So you can hide incompatible, and you can hide the ones that require an adapter if you don't have an adapter yet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. That's so it would show that just magic. So you could just look at magic docs, basically. Yeah. Okay. Rivian's integration is fantastic. I don't know what uh, uh, what Kyle thinks about. You see the screen, Kyle, where it even tells you the price. I mean, Rivian did it right. You know, Ford, they're way Ford's way behind Rivian as far as information that's displayed during the whole charging session. You see 
the charging power, you see the amount of kilowatt hour put, you know, dispensed by the station, and you see the price going up on the driver screen, which is really cool. And time to charge, you know, to, time to hit your set point, which uh, the Ford does that also. But I've been ragging on Ford forever to improve what you get in the uh, the as far as charging information while you're charging, whether it be on Tesla or on Electrify America or whatever. Ford's terrible with that. They give you really bad information and they know that and they know I know they're working on it. But I don't think we're going to see that as an upgrade in the lightning. I think that's going to be on that next generation T3 in another year or so in 2025 when that comes out. But uh, I loved how Tesla, how Rivian presents their information on the driver's screen, front and center. Um, so much of what you want to know, you know, and then, of course, you get the email summary that summarizes everything. Kyle showed that in his video. Um, which was, um, you know, I, I really like how, how Rivian integrated th this uh, system. And so Kyle was saying that you can you can pay through the Tesla app, but you can also pay, is there another, how do you pay, is there, is there through the Rivian app or through your car? Exactly. How does that work? Same yeah, as with your the, Tesla. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, it's the same as your Tesla. You have a card in your Rivian account and it just bills that. Okay. And so same with Ford, Dom. Um, no. Okay. Okay. Right, right. Because... Ford is also has supercharger access and you can use the, the Ford Pass app. Is that, that's the name of it, right? Yeah. Right. On the Rivian uh, app, it sort of makes linked to your credit card. You get a nice receipt that shows you the session details, you know, the cost, the amount of kilowatt hours, the time you plugged in. And it, it's interesting. I noticed it's, it even is down to the second. <laughs> wow. It tells okay. you, like, you, you, I, I charge 39 minutes and 48 seconds, which was really good. I did a 10 to 80% charging session in 40 minutes uh, on the supercharger, which is um, it's actually better than what I've gotten on uh, most of my experiences on Electrify America. So you can see that all there in the detail. And uh, um, I paid uh, 34 cents a kilowatt hour, which is low. I usually pay more than that in my area, but I, it's, it's all dynamic pricing with Tesla. When you plug in, I was charging at like the lowest um, uh, uh, rate of, time. of the day, you know, when yeah. I was there. Right on. <clears throat> all right, so that seems all pretty straightforward then. So the, basically, the only other question is the the adapter. So uh, Rivian said they're sending out adapters starting April. Well, they're going to start letting you uh, 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 apply for your adapter soon, and then they said right. they will begin shipping in April. But it's uh -huh. going to take many, many, many months um, right. to get these out to Ford customers and uh, Rivian. Rivian really hasn't expressed that that clearly. Ford has. Ford's come out and said, look, we've got a lot of customers. Rivian has even more customers that that, that are going to want them. Um, and Tesla's ability to produce these isn't going to be as it's not going to be able to meet the demand. So, you know, Ford really said, you know, you may wait many months before you get it. And I'm, I'm sure that's going to be the case with Rivian. They're not going to get priority over Ford. Right. So if people want to charge up the Rivian on, on a Tesla supercharger, they need to get an adapter, basically. And uh, so you've been you you said you have these two adapters that you've chosen out of there's a bunch of them like on Amazon or whatever. But maybe they're not all safe or all you are listed and all that kind of safety stuff. Uh, so maybe just tell us about the two adapters that you've chosen and why. And I guess you have already one video where you've done all, all kinds of testing. So maybe you can just outline what, what sort of testing you're doing so people can have an idea. Sure. So what, I, what I'm doing, it, and I'm not an engineer, I'm not, I'm not opening them up. Um, you, I did already post videos where I talked to the CEOs of both of these companies. It's A to Z and Electron. I've also talked to engineers that have worked on the adapters. And uh, basically, none of the adapters are certified yet, not even the Tesla adapter, because there is no official certification that is ready to have the adapter certified. Um, we, ha we haven't had an electric vehicle adapter certification, a UL certification yet, um, okay. but there is one, there's an outline and it's gonna be finalized relatively soon from what I understand. It's called UL2252. And I have the full UL2252 documents. I even incorporate them on in my video. And basically uh, once that's finalized, uh, both A to Z and Electron, the two companies I've decided to review, are going to submit their adapters for certification. They both claim that they've engineered the adapters to meet and exceed UL2252 standards. And A to Z is actually on like the, the UL2252 committee. Okay. They're a, a, you know, a, a part, part of that, 
that process. So, um, uh, so basically, that's the only reason why I picked these two companies because they they seem like they're making a really strong effort to have this certified. So, um, I reviewed the A to Z adapter. I, I'm charging my lightning from 10% to 80%. Every five minutes, I'm taking a uh, uh, temperature reading of the adapter and finding the warmest spot on the adapter. And I'm documenting that and I'm printing it out. Um, and uh, then just basically talking about the quality, the fit and feel, how the uh, uh, the locks, each adapter has a lock on each side, the NAC side, the CCS1 side, um, how they have uh, what their uh, internal temperature controls are, um, you know, basically the, the, how I feel the robust robustness of the uh, uh, adapter is. That's really all I can do at this point. So I, I published the A to Z review last week. I'm publishing the Electron review this weekend. I've already had it here. We have, if you're watching on YouTube, I have the temperature of the uh, adapter uh, as I, every five minutes when I plug in and when I unplug. And then I also note the ambient temperature. So th these temperatures are way under what the UL2252 um, standard is going to uh, uh, call for. The adapter, the uh, exterior surfaces of the adapter during charging um, is supposed to remain under 140 degrees Fahrenheit uh, during charging. But it was 55 degrees out, 55 at, at start, 51 at completion of the charging session. So okay. I got to get out to like Arizona or something when it gets mm. really hot and do a full charging recording when it's like 120 degrees out with all three adapters, you know, which I will do in the summer once it warms up. I can only do what I have here now. Um, so that's basically where we're at. Where we're at. Um, I've also worked out with both A to Z and Electron that um, I have a, uh, a discount code. And if you order them from my discount code, you get 15% off both of these adapters. Um, I know my followers are going to want to buy third-party adapters, and I'm trying to steer them in what I believe is the right direction. I don't want them buying that junk out there that costs, you know, $50 less than these that doesn't have thermal safety, doesn't have good locking mechanisms. We know we're going to get these. We saw it with the CCS1 to, to, to Tesla adapters. There's some of them out there that are like 80 bucks. They're horrible, and they're, they're totally unsafe. So, um, yeah, I don't like uh, telling people that they should – um, or, or that they should consider uh, uh, violating terms of service. You guys know my channel is really about safety. A lot of it is about charging safety. And here I am saying, well, you know, if you're going to buy a non-approved adapter, you know, buy one of these. So I, I've, I've struggled with that a little, but I've come to the realization that I know people are going to buy these. Right. Let's face it, they're going to buy thousands of them. And if I can help people maybe buy ones that I think are engineered better than the garbage ones, then that that's really why I'm doing this. Right on. Uh, so you have so we you see we had you have your A to Z adapter video already out. People can check that out on your set of charge channel. Uh, when does the electron one happen? Over the weekend. I've already done it, um, okay. but I have another video I have to post first today. I'm going to actually be posting my Polestar three um, video where I drove it on a frozen lake up in the Arctic Circle. Um, nice. So, so over the weekend, I'm going to post the uh, the Electron uh, adap adapter review, and I will have the discount code in there if somebody wants to order one. But the last thing I will say on this is, as I said, as of now, no, but none of these adapters are certified in Tesla, and all the manufacturers have come out and said we only want you to use the official Tesla adapter while you're charging on our network, and I understand that. But I do believe that once the UL2252 is complete. And there are adapters that are UL2252 certified. I believe some of the OEMs, if not all of them, are going to say, okay, you can use any UL certified adapter on our network. I believe that's going to be the case. We'll see. But um, uh, I don't know why they wouldn't. If, it, if, it, if the adapter gets uh, certified, you know, as safety certified, I wouldn't imagine people having a problem with it. In the past, no adapters have been safety certified, which is why the uh, networks like Electrify America, EVGo, and so forth have said, we don't want you using anything on our network except what you bought from the automaker. They're they're putting that onus on the automakers to only recommend adapters that they've thoroughly tested. You know, and right. there's going to be hundreds of these out there. The companies aren't going to be testing them themselves. They're just going to say, if it's UL certified, you could use it on our network. That's what I believe. 
Right on. Okay. Uh, so I guess we should move on from th that uh, story and just, but since we're talking about electric trucks, uh, I guess, Kyle, let's talk a little bit about what you've been doing this week in that area. So basically I understand that you've wrangled a bunch of electric pickup trucks and, uh, everything that's basically everything that's on the market right now. And then you're putting them through a battery of tests, pun totally intended. Uh, this week, you put up the first of those videos, a two hour and 15 minute monster that covers you know, 75 mile an hour uh, or 70 mile an hour highway range testing. Uh, now this video was a little different from your other range test videos in that you give us the results right at the beginning of the video and show us how only one truck met its EPA rated range. Um, you're also using a slightly different methodology, methodology this time because you have some new equipment in that range testing um, in your range test, the way you conduct them. So I guess maybe why don't you tell us a little, little bit about that and how the trucks did? Well, also just want to be clear. No truck has met its EPA oh, rating. Okay. Um, because the EPA does not rate the Tesla Cybertruck. Oh, true, true. And the Cybertruck's not EPA rated. I don't know which way you would phrase it, but right. yep. So, uh, it's just Tesla's estimate, but it did really well. Um, all the trucks did really well, uh, actually, and I think we just got super lucky with great conditions for range testing. But uh, the procedure hasn't changed. We always uh, charge them up to 70, drain them. Uh, oftentimes, we do drain them uh, right. all the way down to where you know they can barely make it to the charger. But in this case, we just had the comfort of being able to um, do our 70 mile per hour loop, but just stay on the highway and go till they stop moving. And um, yeah, so it was really interesting. The results, again, we, we put them up front. There's a link in the description of that video as well to our website, which has an interactive uh, sort of data field that you can play around with all of the data we've captured. So we tested the Lightning extended range, the Silverado big battery, the Rivian with not the biggest battery, but the large pack with the dual motor. We've learned there's only a small difference between the max pack and the large pack. And we just couldn't find a max pack. Uh, and then, of course, we had the Tesla Cybertruck. This was the tri-motor version. Uh, but uh, both, uh, you know, there's a single primary axle on both vehicle that is a permanent magnet. The secondary axles are induction on both. So the range shouldn't be that different dual motor to tri-motor. And this did really well. And it far exceeded our dual motor test. Uh, that I had done a few months ago uh, at lower elevation and colder temperatures, but still and different they, tires, right? Nope, same tires. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So just still, um, yeah, not sure how this did so well, uh, but it did really well. So yeah, fun, fun video. No, no one really has to watch it. We we put all the data right up front, but if you want to see how we do everything, it's all in there, and it was really fun to do. Yeah, no, it's I mean, I, saw, I watched the beginning of it in the little summary and everything, but then I, I enjoyed the the just like the meat of the video it's long but whatever it's kind of it's fun to watch and it's yeah um so definitely do that so the silverado you use is the w4 4 wt so that's as big as because it comes in what does it come in just wt 2 wt 3 wt 4 wt yeah i think so okay um yeah so what it, who is the, i mean the range king is obviously the silverado ev but how, how do the other ones do yeah so the silverado well over 400 miles 434 miles it was two less than our lucid test uh but keep in mind those weren't run on the same day so i've actually asked lucid to send us a grand touring uh because i want to run truck the the silverado and the lucid side by side in the same conditions uh, not in our 70 mile per hour test, but in another test we want to do. So that could be interesting. Uh, the two range heroes on the EV market, essentially one that is super efficient, sleek and aerodynamic. The other one, that's a truck that they just dumped a ton of batteries in. Um, but honestly, that's what you need for a truck. So it uh, works pretty well. The uh, next longest range vehicle was the Rivian R1T. This is the dual motor large pack, uh, well over 340 miles in that one as well. Really nice. That was on the 21 inch road wheels and tires. So optimally specced and um, yeah, did, did well. I had run that exact vehicle in another range test previously. Uh, and there it did a you know, maybe like 20 miles less or something like that. But again, conditions were so much better than when I ran them last time. That's why whenever I do a comparison on range, we always run them on the same day side by side because conditions really affect the results. A single range test is how far a vehicle will go at that point in time on our loop in these 
exact weather conditions, and everything can affect range, especially when we're talking about the full charge range of a vehicle. Uh, the Cybertruck was in third place, still doing over 300 miles at 70 miles an hour. Huge surprise for all of us, really impressive. And then in last place was the um, F-150 Lightning, but keep in mind that's kind of a brick and uh, it's still got a relatively large battery pack. It, it wasn't that far behind. It still did over 280 miles. And uh, honestly, I ended just a bit earlier than I thought I was going to be. So it was a few hundred feet of elevation higher than where the other trucks ended. So I would say you could. It's, it wouldn't change the order. It's not like that thing was doing 300, but it may have added another four or five miles, something like that. Okay. And did the uh, so did the Ford Lightning uh, run out of battery at the zero indicated zero percent, or how did that work? Yeah, so the reason you're asking is we've had a couple issues with the BMS on our Lightning when it, when you're doing consistent driving. And I actually just had a meeting with the Ford engineers about it yesterday. Oh, cool. When you're doing a consistent driving on the vehicle, which is like our use case of racing the trucks across the country or Tom and I racing from New Jersey down to uh, Florida, you know, you're driving, charging, driving, charging, and their BMS calculations require tuning. They start to sway and they, you, every charging stop, it just gets a little bit farther off, farther off, farther off to the point where our lightning died on our cross country trip with 6% remaining uh, indicated. And, you know, that's after over 2,000 miles of consistent driving over 40 hours, but still the other trucks did not experience this issue and the teams were running them to dead. And right. so the Ford engineers were like, this is great data. Thank you so much. I spent 30, 45 minutes on the phone with them yesterday nice. with the team in the Lightning who drove it. Um, you know, we they explained to us how they do their calculations and how our data will help them plan for uh, a better test. You can see right here, this is right at the end when it was dying. Um, but essentially, uh, in this test, I followed their reset procedures, which was I let it sit for a couple days or even, you know, they said let it sit for 30 minutes. But I let it sit for two days at a medium state of charge, about 25 or 30 okay. percent. I then charged it up to full and let it complete and sit. And now it's totally back in shape. It knows what's up. And so uh, it drove like five miles past zero. Oh, sweet. Yeah. That's better than the, that's better than the other way around. So, right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just one of those things where, you know, they they take their battery pack measurements when the truck is at rest and in between they do Coulomb counting. And if you have just a bit of sway in that algorithm over 15 charging sessions in 2000 miles, you're mm -hmm. going to have a, a, you know, just an increasing amount of sway. And that's uh -huh. why the vehicle shut off before um you know, it, it, it was at bottom pack voltage. That's the thing. Like the battery was dead. It was just indicating right. to the user it's not dead. Right. Um, so how, in that respect, how did the other ones do? So Cybertruck went to zero or past, you went past zero somewhat? Yeah, every truck went comfortably past zero. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, that's great because that's, yeah. But is like it, a... I think zero should be off as soon as it shows oh, really? dash dash you have like a couple hundred watt hours and you're done yeah because i now when i drive my cyber truck this is the kyle connor mentality <laughs> i'm gonna be like oh it says negative two percent arrival to the charger well i know i can go four percent below zero the equivalent so i'm just gonna go for it and then if there is bms sway if there is an issue then oh well here i am screwed on the side of the road i i really like volkswagen group strategy which is in their vehicles zero is off it's a they're very german there's there's right, right. <laughs> zero doesn't mean anything other than zero and that to me is that's a relaxing way to do because i know exactly how much energy i have left before the car shuts off right i guess that makes some sense yeah i like i like having a little bit of it's just a little buffer there at the end just in case i miscalculate you know things kind of go things go wrong like sometimes they do <laughs> yeah sure well there is a buffer below zero in most electric cars including teslas uh, that are designed right. i would never rely on it and would never recommend our audience to rely on it because uh, as vehicles age the performance of that buffer the behavior of that buffer does change and of course um you know we we tend to test vehicles brand new in our range tests so they're usually pretty solid but uh you know if you have a two hundred thousand mile ev i'm not sure i'd trust that buffer below zero right I, I just thought it was very cool that you could bring your charger to the trucks as they died on the side of the road towing on behind the rivian in there with i guess colby had that did that with Colby and uh, his new little friend? 
Uh, yeah, so Colton had it with his golden Col- retriever. Col- not Colby. Col- yeah, Colby's right. our other Rivian guy. Uh, <laughs> but yes, uh, so Colton uh, ran up, grabbed my truck, and then saved the Lightning, and then I grabbed the Rivian and picked up the rest of the trucks off right. the side of the road. The Cybertruck does not charge on the Autel unit. Um, uh, it might on its newest software update. I know Tesla was working on some interoperability stuff. Uh, okay. So I have to try it today, actually, uh, see if it goes. But um, yeah, so we just had that towed back to the office. Right on. Um, so I guess this might be a good time to mention uh, that you put your Cybertruck ownership out the update out there after your first full week and 4,500 miles. <laughs> uh, I thought this was hilarious, man. Who, who, yeah, he has more miles on that than I have on my Rivian R1S, and I've owned it since <laughs> September. So just, just putting that out there. <laughs> One week, and you drove it all the way from you know. I guess you picked it up in Florida, uh, drove it drove it to. I think you were dr- driving around fl- Florida a little bit down to Jackson or down to Daytona, back up to Jacksonville, over to San Diego, up to Wyoming on the west side of the the Rockies on the back side of the mountain range there, and then down back to home in Colorado. It looked like it had forty five hundred miles on it after that, actually. And I guess Colton cleaned it up. Okay, because it was looking pretty good in that uh, range test video. Yeah, so his first wash video goes live today of our Cybertruck. And oh, um, yeah, it's uh, we used it. Well, that's what we have it for. We have it for testing. So we're going to test the hell out of it. Uh, so a- anything you want to mention about your first week with the Cybertruck? Living up to your expectations kind of? Yeah, totally. I mean, we the expectations were mixed. So yes, I would say it is as expected. But, um, you know, there were some fit and finish issues that I'd love to see them dial in, which they have, Tesla, of course, is going to fix, especially with some panel stuff. Not that it's a huge deal for me, but I also have one rattle in the back I want them to, to take care of. Um, but overall, it's a very high quality feeling Tesla. It's the best uh, quality Tesla I've ever taken delivery of. That's okay. not saying it's the best quality car I've ever taken delivery of, but right. the best quality Tesla. Uh, my Model S had to. I had a laundry list of items when I got that, and that's that was 12 years after start of production of the Model S, or 11 years, and they still hadn't dialed that in. This is more dialed in than that. So very very impressed overall, honestly. And uh, the the attention that this truck gets in person is crazy. We actually hide it uh, so we don't park it at home anymore because like people were coming by the house and blocking our driveway we couldn't leave it was wow. crazy so like we we have hid the cyber truck and i'm not telling anyone where it is uh i've never had anything that gets so much attention truly it is you have to be so in the mood to have all of your appointment to be late to everything if you drive the cyber truck because everyone will just talk to you uh, which is great. I love it when I have the time to talk to people. So when I'm driving it, come on up, talk to me. But if I don't have time, I'm not driving the Cybertruck. That's for sure. Um, it's uh, unbelievably quick. I mean, it's the tri-motor version, so it right. rips. It's uh, surprisingly efficient, as we learned in this range test. And uh, yeah, it's been been a really great vehicle. No bugs, no issues. Uh, I, I'm hoping for more features to come. I really want locking diffs. We're doing all of our off-roading testing next week, uh, oh. whether it has locking diffs or not. <laughs> so oh, no. they, they better software update it with some locking diffs. Yeah. Um, yeah so, uh, you know, little things like autopilot. Still no autopilot. What the heck? Uh, and I yes. guess they, they haven't figured out how to control the steer by wire. Okay. Don't launch oh. a product that's not finished. I don't, I don't understand it. So anyway, um, you know, little things like that, I would say the autopilot's not a little thing, but, um, overall the, the, the bones of the vehicle, the structure, the mechanical components, uh, at least for all of our on-road driving have Mm -hmm. been great today. I'm putting 10,000 pounds on the back of it and towing through the mountains. And then tomorrow we're towing over the entire Rocky mountain range with all of the, uh, trucks. Uh, so we have. Wait, wait, what are you towing? Are you going to tow Kodas over there, over the mountains? Uh, Model threes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So each truck will have a Model three on the back of it, basically. Nice. Yeah, because we know so many people with Model threes. We're like, hey, can we just put your car in a trailer? <laughs> and so, yeah, uh, we're going to put Model threes on the uh, trailers. Uh, we've just gone for four U-Haul trailers. I needed four identical trailers. Right. And right. we we reached out to like every trailer sales place here, and they're like. We, yeah, you, you could, we have three, we have one. And I'm like, I need four identical. Um, so anyway, th- this is, will be really interesting because uh, I tow with my electric truck a lot, my Rivian. 
and right. it sucks. There's no way around it. It is the mm-hmm. worst. If you if you tow a short distance, it's amazing. You don't feel the trailer back there. Truck right. handles it great, but the to interface with charging infrastructure and a trailer is awful. The Silverado EV that we have might solve my issues because it's got the biggest battery. So I'm really curious. I'm going to drive that on this test. Yeah. And I'm as a personal interest, I am so excited for 200. 15 kilowatt hour usable plus trailer uh that's magic to my ears right on um okay so uh, any anything else that you're going to be testing besides the towing with the, with uh, the truck oh yeah but you'll have to wait and see okay um right so b- just before we head in the news is that everything there Yes. Okay. I just wanted to say, I just want to be say to look, be on the lookout for tomorrow for an interview on this channel with uh, BJ Burwell, the founder and organizer, organizer of the Electrify Expo. That's a touring exhibition making its way through eight cities this year. Uh, and last week, when last weekend was the first in Orlando, Florida, then it's, it'll be going to Phoenix, Long Beach, Denver, San Francisco, Seattle, New York, and Austin. Uh, I have a video up on the Drive Electric with Dominic YouTube channel. Uh, d- basically taking you through the entire setup in Orlando. Um, it's a, a chance to see not only like electric vehicles from a number of brands, but also drive them in a real world type of setting. So besides that, they have displays of uh, customized cars and lots of micro mobility products like e-bikes and electric skateboards, which you can also take for little rides. So if you're in the market for an EV, it's definitely, I, I thought it was definitely worth checking out. Um, I also wanted to say how cool it was to see the crowds there in Orlando. That for that first one, lots of people, very diverse crowd. Like a lot, there were tons of EVs in the parking lot, and uh, but I overheard plenty of people who were like skeptical, you know, walking around or unsure about EVs and everything. But it was cool that they took the time, you know, to go there and check things out in person. So that was a pretty cool experience, I thought. And yeah, so we should have that interview up tomorrow morning on this channel. I have to do some editing after this show. Um, so, okay, I guess, so the big news of the week has to be the debut of the Audi Q6 e-tron and its spicy sibling, the SQ6 uh, e-tron. So th- these are both dual motor cars built on the premium platform electric or PPE, which it shares with the Porsche Macan that also just launched like last month. Um, of course, the Audi has a different bodywork than the Macan and has been developed somewhat separately. So also, Audi says it will introduce a rear-wheel drive variants at some point, besides these two initial vehicles. Um, so I have some numbers to go through, and I should note that I'll be talking about U.S. versions of the car, which make more power than the European versions. I'm not sure what that is, why that is. They don't, they don't trust you over there, Martin. Is that is that the issue? That'll be it. Power limited. So the regular Q6 will offer 315 kilowatts or 422 horsepower, like nominal. And that that's going to be, uh, that's going up to 340 kilowatts or 456 horsepower when it's under the influence of launch control. And then the spicy SQ6 starts out with even higher numbers than that with 360 kilowatts or 483 horsepower nominal and then going all the way up to 380 kilowatts or 510 horsepower when you use a launch control. So that gives the regular Q6 an estimated 0 to 60 time of 5 seconds with the launch control and then the SQ6 a 4 second estimated 0 to 60. So that's uh, that's slower than the quickest Porsche Macan which is a 3.1 I believe. But the outright speed isn't what the Q6 is all about. The uh, So the Q6 has a prismatic cell, 100 kilowatt hour battery that's 94.9% use, or kilowatt hours usable. Uh, Audi isn't giving us a range figure just yet for the US, but the Q6 will achieve over 300 miles of EPA rated range, they say. And they also say the SQ6 range will just be announced later this year. In Europe, they did give us a range in WLTP, on the WLTP cycle. And so there it's three, 625 kilometers or 388 miles. So 388 miles, that's just a little bit more, I think, than uh, what they're saying the Porsche Macan gets. That's, I think, 381. So this might do a little bit more range. Uh, DC power peaks at 270 kilowatts. So it can recharge from 10 to 80% in 21 minutes, which is very good. AC charging in the US maxes up at 9.6 kilowatts. The Audi e-tron, the Audi Q6 e-tron will go to European customers first with orders opening this month and deliveries starting this summer. 
so there it's going to be priced at 74 between 74,700 uh, euros and I guess 93,800 euros for the spicy one US pricing not yet available but I, I'm thinking it should start around $75,000 but I'm not sure maybe Kyle maybe you have a different uh, suggestion about the price but I don't think you have you haven't driven this yet I believe Jordan from out of spec went to check this out about you were watching his video on the screen um, but you're familiar with how Audi differentiates itself though. Uh, so what do you expect from a package like this? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I think Audi is in a very confused state right now. Okay. Um, they have every one of their electric models on a completely different architecture that has no relation to the other. Right. And I've been saying this for a long time and this just adds to the confusion. So is PPE underpinning future Audis? Yes, we know it's gonna do the A6, the A6, whatever wagon Avant they come out with and a few others, but ultimately they're just, they build an incredible product. You know, we own an e-tron. It's actually right over here right now, somewhere behind me, if I can, there it is. Mm -hmm. So like we're, we're fans, we're fans of our Audi. We have it right there, but um, they're just confused. I mean, PPE, MLB, Evo, J1 and MEB are the four platforms that they're using for their vehicles. What, what, what was the Evo one? Sorry. Uh, it's MLB Evo, which is the full size e-tron. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. So um, it's just like, and each one has a different regen strategy. For example, this is the first Volkswagen group product across the entire brand that has one pedal driving. Really? Yeah, so there we go. First time for everything. But like nice. Macan doesn't have it because Porsche's like, ah, we don't right. believe in it. But I do think Porsche will add it in the future, just a gut feeling uh, of talking to everyone. And like, I don't know. I, I was with, I know a lot of people at um, Volkswagen Group that work on these projects. And I was like, you just have to put in one pedal driving. You can just turn it off and let a customer, you know, manually select it, put it 70 menus deep, but just let it be in there because the technology allows it. So it's like, holy crap. Uh, you know, in terms of specs, this hits right down where it needs to be. It is, um, oh, right. Yeah, of course. Uh, Jordan wants uh, on the, uh, an Audi TT electric on SSP, right. <laughs> which would be so another, SSP, another platform. platform, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, so that's, and that's coming. That's going to be across the Volkswagen group, right? Yeah, uh, S it's S gotta be so confusing. But uh, ultimately, to what I think it means to the end customer is someone who's coming out of an Audi and gets into another Audi, things are different. And I'm not sure that's good or bad, but it is the direction they're going. I, I just fail to understand where Audi's core competency is beyond headlight and taillight technology, because <laughs> they're great at that, really great at that. But right. I just, I, I'm just struggling. What is Audi going to be known for into the future? And it's okay. This is a Porsche Macan with an Audi badge. Um, and I know there was a lot of cross collaboration between Porsche and Audi on this platform, but what did Audi do with that? I know what Porsche did. They made the thing rip and handle well. What right. did Audi do here? Um, I mean, they, they, they do talk about the uh, driving dynamics a lot. I mean, they're, I, I suspect they're going to be, you know, a different kind of vehicle than like the Macan, right? But they, they you know, they spent, they do talk about how they, the control arms are now positioned in the front, in front of the suspension arms, and the, the steering rack is now fixed to the subframe, and it's got, it's got rear bias torque, by the way, uh, distribution, it's, and it's, it doesn't have a square tire set up. The rear rear tire is a little bit wider than the front, so they're doing some you know driving dynamics work for sure. But I think they're trying to develop their own identity. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I just think, um, yeah, would would be great to know what that identity is, and maybe this is the start of it. Um, but but certainly, it can't be performance because Porsche is right. always going to be top performance. Um, so it's got to be Euro sophistication. I mean, yeah, that's, well, that's, that's what, uh, kind yeah. of what I go. Sure. Like, so like a... I'm being harsh on them, but I think fairly. Um, uh, so so the Q6 e-tron, from a technical perspective, is the sister car to Macan. So mm -hmm. 270 kilowatt charging deep into the pack. It's going to be incredible road tripper. It's going to have good preconditioning logic. It's going to have plug-in charge. It's going to have good driver assistance. Um, you know, it's going to have, again, great headlights. So it's going to be an awesome car. And in fact, I could actually see some buyers choose this over the Macan just for space. The Macan really slopes down in the back, mm -hmm. and this doesn't. 
Uh, and if you want a road tripper, like the Macan's all about fast traveling. That is the out of spec style, get in dead, rip the fast charging and get out and blast to the next station. Thankfully, this carries over all of those amazing qualities, but now you have some trunk space. Uh, and, you know, so quite a bit more room with this sort of boxier shape. So I actually think it's going to be quite popular. Uh, I, I wish them success with it, but I wish Audi would um, lean into some engineering expertise in something that they're not just pulling from the other brands within the group to uh, make their own products. Right. So Audi has high enough expectations for sales of the Q6. It, it seems like it's... It believes it will sell a lot of them. So they're considering building it here at the Volkswagen Scout factory that's being erected, which is, I mean, according to reporting by Patrick uh, George over at Inside EVs, which, you know, I, I believe he's got the inside scoop on that. Um, so I just thought, was it kind of an interesting staying using other arms of the group for, for that kind of thing? Because they don't really do that so much, right? Do they? I mean, Volkswagen. Uh, Volkswagen Group is starting to lean into the group rather than individual brands. Okay. And I've noticed it too, just by talking to a few people there, sitting into some presentations, uh, talking with executives. Even just the Volkswagen guys are starting to reference Porsche and Audi and other brands that are sold as well, talking about Scout, of course. So, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that this would be happening. I think that might be a path forward for the overall group is to leverage each individual brands, uh, uh, not necessarily against each other, but together. So it could be kind of interesting to see what they do into the future with that strategy. If, if you watch the, the, those of us watching on YouTube right now can see that we're looking at Jordan on, in the interior of the car and it looks pretty dark and kind of stylish. It looks pretty nice in there, I guess. Um, I, I think the interior is the least visually attractive part of this car. The exterior looks fine. Okay. Um, I don't think I like that screen. I've sat in the Q6 e-tron before. I've played around with it. Um, yeah, it just was like not into the inside, personally. I think the steering wheel's weird. Um, yeah, the passenger display looks weird. It all is just like, it seems like it's all Macan stuff, just like slapped on the interior of an Audi. But I don't know. This is Macan. So this has the infotainment system, in, and this has the, it uses Android Automotive OS. And yep. like, is it, does the Macan have that as well? Yep. Okay, so it's the same basic software. Well, we can assume they're using the same Android base, but I don't know if it's the same hardware computing on the back end. I see. I see. I, all I know about it is that you go, you're going to be able to download third-party apps like YouTube and, and things, navigation, music, uh, videos. Yeah. And the route planning is unbelievably fast. Jordan said he tried it out as well. Um, oh, so same as Macan. It's like you can pick the longest distance you want and boom, it routes out your charging stations, everything for you. And it's it's crazy how fast it can do it. Sweet. Well, that's nice. That's promising sounding. Uh, okay. I don't know if anything else we want to say about Martin. You have anything, thoughts on the Macan? Or I was going to ask Audi you, e -tron? Kyle, on the, when you drove the Macan, because um, they keep saying 270 kilowatts maximum charge speed. Are they low balling or do you think that's right? Uh, nope, they'll do 270. 270 oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if they're going to aim for 300 on this. No. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, it's still, it's still spectacular. I'm not, I don't want to come across as ungrateful. <laughs> yeah, tw was it 21 minutes, 10 to 80%? It's, a, a, 90... it's a really low pack voltage um, for a 800 volt system. It's like 630 nominal, something like that. So they just sit at 400 amps. So it actually climbs a bit when you initially plug in. And then uh, it tapers at like 60, 65 percent. Right. So it's a great curve, great charging. I mean, that's that's one thing. This is this is what also confuses me at Audi. If I can continue my rant, is sure. their Q6 e-tron now is significantly better than their Q8 flagship e-tron. Oh yeah, well, that's true, right? Because that's on the old what do you call it, MLB Evo. Yeah, but it's it's Evo. the thing is it's a hundred kilowatt faster peak charging and right. for way longer. So how that makes no sense to me. Right. Yeah. Um, but Q6 is good. Yeah. I guess Q8 is right. It's supposed to be a flagship model. So it should have all the top specs of everything. But, but as you say, like this has got the new, it was on the newest platform. So 
Yeah, and it's going to be, I think it's going to address as a bigger audience than anybody. There's a larger addressable market here for the Q6. That's like a size that I guess sells pretty well in that. Yeah, it's going to be a very popular card. The platform's solid. Uh, like I said, I've driven Macan quite a bit. We've done videos on that. Um, yeah, so it's going to be a great car. It's going to be a buy. I think what it also means is Q8s are going to get real cheap. Oh, that's good for the aftermarket. As someone was just saying earlier, thanking you, Kyle, for uh, recommending a uh, the e-tron. E looking for her, Linda, somebody was up there in the comments. Yeah, we love recommending e-trons. They're amazing. That's the thing with Audi. They're, they're confusion. Don't get my uh, calling them confused as to what the feature is as bad. They're, all of their products are great in their own way, except for maybe the Q4. I'm not super into the Q4 e-tron. But, um, you know, all of the other products are amazing. You know, the e-tron GT rocks. The full-size e-tron rocks. This is going to rock. But they all rock in their own different way. And it's just confusing to me. Right. So, the, uh, the Q... how, how do you think the uh, PP eight hundred volt uh, vehicles are going to charge on superchargers? Uh, so they go split pack one hundred and thirty five kilowatt peak. Okay. Oh, really? It's still four hundred amps, just yeah, at it's... lower pack voltage. Yep. So that will take. Uh, it won't take twice as long to charge them, though, right? Yeah. Oh, it will take twice as long to charge it. It's like forty. Well, yeah, because you're 10, getting 80? half the charging power. Okay. Hmm. So maybe not the best one to supercharge with at this point in time no you'd be using anything but superchargers with the superchargers would just be a nice backup option that's right. that's the thing if you're on a road trip and there's there's a supercharger there and and you can't make the next ccs1 station you don't mind sitting there for an extra 15 minutes <laughs> just guess, to get yeah. to your next destination so i guess i mean it's so great that we're gonna have these options you know we're basically doubling the available um places to plug in or more than doubling or now probably doubling the amount of places to plug in if you have a ccs1 equipped car so this is great for the industry here yeah and and evkx brings up a good point i just i'm on mobile so it's hard to read the comments but q8s do charge faster on superchargers than the q6 okay so there's still an advantage to that q to q8 if you only use superchargers, but still that's not fast enough. I mean, we're talking, we're in the world of 300 plus kilowatt charging cars. Now it's right. 2024. If your car's not doing 300 kilowatts and it's a road tripper, go home. Right. I mean, this doesn't quite hit two, you know, it's 270. Yeah. But it's still a decent time. I think for, for 95 yeah, kilowatt close hours, enough. but it's like the Tycon, you know, that new J one update platform, which hopefully the e-tron GT will get as well. 320 kilowatts to 65 percent amazing so cool and i've also been living with silverado ev the last few days and so i'm used to just pegged at 365 kilowatts but that's a huge battery in a huge truck it's pretty so crazy you can get 365 at a three uh, 355 or 350 kilowatt charger yeah, so the, three, the the way Electrify America does it is they don't rate their chargers on peak output. They rate them in the class of charger uh -huh. because they use different hardware suppliers that all have a slightly different peak. Um, so, yes, BTC EA stations will do 365 pretty easily. But Hummer EV will charge even faster, and same with Silverado. They'll do 375, 377 if you have a charger that can give it that much juice. So we need those 400 kilowatt chargers. Yeah, like an Alpi 400, the, you know, whatever else is, you know, 400 kilowatts, that would really be perfect for those things. All right. Uh, or that's, that's uh, what's uh, the outfit, the mobile, um, uh, what's that, mobility, gravity, mobility, gravity. I guess, has the five, 500 kilowatt hour deal at there. Oh, uh, so they have a 500 kilowatt uh, charger is what I saw in the headlines. I've not dug into any of it. I don't know right. if that's per dispenser. Right. Uh, I think we, hopefully we'll be talking to them next uh next week early in the week so that that episode may go up on tuesday if everything works out we've had some scheduling issues it's hard everyone's really busy um all right so sticking with volkswagen brands uh, another interesting bit of news this week is the announcement that cooper is coming to the u.s with two evs so cooper was the performance trim of the spanish seat brand that is uh, but it's now its own standalone brand and its design language leans heavily towards performance, I think you could say. The timing of this is uh, given as before the end of the decade. So the plan is right now to start with two electric SUVs, the Formentor, which is a compact crossover SUV that will, uh, that's, so that will be one of those things. And then there'll be another larger SUV 
possibly the t Tavascan, which I've, I think is a more of a ID4 equivalent kind of size vehicle. I think it's just a little bit longer. And that's launching in Europe this year, actually. So the cars will be built in North America, they say, so maybe in Mexico. So they should be eligible for federal incentives. But uh, maybe the most interesting part of this whole deal is that they will supposedly be sold through a new distribution model and launching first in key states on the two coasts and maybe in the south. So I think that's a pretty cool news, but also frustrating because Cooper makes the born which is basically the, its version of the VW ID3, which is a, you know, a smaller vehicle than the ID4. It also has a smaller vehicle launching next year called the Raval, but these products weren't mentioned, so they may not be coming here, and I don't know. So, Tom, have you driven Cupra? No, I actually haven't. I've never driven a Cupra. Okay. Um, you know, I, I like that new model. I like how it looks, at least. Um, uh, I don't really know a lot about them. I think we should probably, I mean, Kyle probably has a, a little bit of a grip, but I know Martin uh, certainly knows the Cooper brand well. Um, I think it's good, personally, a strategy for, for, for the group to, to bring the vehicles here. But um, I'm interested in the new uh, sales model, exactly what they're, uh, exactly they're going to try to do. You know, um, that's going to be interesting because, you know, there's an ongoing battle here with um, net dealer, the dealer networks and the dealer lobby, and uh, they will be waiting, uh, you know, on the beach with their guns blazing. If if uh, Cooper's, you know, ships uh, pulling up, wanting to set up shop here and sell directly, so uh, it'll be interesting uh, how this works out. But I hope they do. I just hope more and more companies try to take on the uh, the stranglehold that uh, the dealer network has here in the U.S. Okay. I was a bit surprised by this this new distribution model kind of idea. I, I just assumed that oh, this would be a great opportunity for you know Volkswagen dealerships to expand, and also the, one of the things that dealerships help automakers with is like just financing the whole rollout of a launch of new cars across. You know, um, yeah, because they're they're financially committed, and that the that really automakers really kind of lean on them for, for some of that help, you know? And so if they're doing it without any of that, I don't know. It's, I, I feel like it's trickier and not, uh, I don't know, not as obvious an approach. Kyle, you have some thoughts on that? Yes. Sorry. I was just typing a note to you guys. I'm going to oh. run and do some toe testing in a moment. I just want to okay. get, get out, but yeah, I've driven Cupra's love Cupra. It's the, it, you know, started under Seat, which is sort of the less expensive or more, I don't know, the the working people's car if you will after volkswagen went a little bit more upmarket they've always had a fun vibe about them they've had uh cool storage ideas different little you know things in the car it was like gave the brand a real down-to-earth personality cupra came out as the um you know spicy version of that so you could get you know uh a, a, a seat cupra a seat whatever then the Cooper was like, ah, oh, you got the spicy one. It was like a, you know, an AMG, but not obviously that crazy. And now they're their own brand essentially. And uh, they have a ID3 version. I've spent some time in that. I've spent some, t have I driven a Cooper born? I don't know, but I've driven some Cupras uh, throughout. I've driven their Formento. I've driven some other stuff and uh, yeah, they're cool. They've got a great personality, great little uh, fun things in them, but they're, they're all just Volkswagens, just a different, different version. Sure. It's kind of like Polestar being the uh, performance uh, models of Volvo and then going out on their own, you know, so it's very similar to that. And to circle back really quick to the, the dealer thing that Dom was talking about, that there's advantages. See you, Kyle. See you, Kyle. Uh, that, there's, that there's advantages. Um, yeah, there are advantages to the automaker, but I think all in all, it's, it's an overall negative for the automakers. It adds a tremendous amount of cost. Um, you know, Ford had talked about being at like a 30% price disadvantage with Tesla um, and, and the reason why they wanted to do the set pricing. And, you know, of course, um, they took on their dealer network and they're, you know, I wouldn't say they're losing, but there's a <laughs> they're taking some artillery, <laughs> that's for sure. And they had to back uh, back away from some of their ori original um expectations of how they wanted to do this set pricing that was ordered through the uh, OEM's uh, uh, website. And then you would, obviously the sale would happen at the dealership, but you could, you could order it uh, directly from Ford, um, Ford's website. 
So, you know, it, it, there's definitely some advantages, uh, Don, but I think overall, I think if, if, if the companies don't somehow get a lot, be allowed to offer some sort of set pricing, it, it, it people are going to continue to run to the companies that do allow it. Some of these startups, and that's going to further cripple the uh, the existing legacy brands. They all want to make some kind of a hybrid direct sales model. You know, I know I get a lot of heat, a lot of comments online where people are like, you know, to hell with Ford until they can. I'm not buying one until they can sell direct. All these companies want to have some sort of a direct sales model, but they can't. It's right. it's against the law, and the right. dealer lobby has such a stranglehold on it. They fight when they and they they have tons they hundreds of millions of dollars they're contributing to our politicians to make sure that you know whoever is next uh you know in office that they'll side on the dealerships side and they won't rewrite the laws the dealership laws that we have in this country so it's going to be a long battle but i hope start companies like cupra new companies that come to this market take it on and it, maybe it'll continue to chip away at the strength that the dealer lobby has here right yeah, it should be interesting to see how that all rolls out. I'm just still like bummed over the fact or them not mentioning, maybe they will bring the compact once vehicles here because it was just like a little blurb on this, uh, you know, part of a bigger presentation on, on the, uh, I think financial health of the company or something. And maybe Martin's more familiar with what happened there or not. <laughs> not really. <laughs> okay, it's okay. Uh, yeah. So just. But you know, I, I just like to see them see some hot hatches in, in their just some or smaller you know city cars in in this country you know that are electric because you know the Volkswagen sells the Golf here, spicy Golfs even. Uh, you could, there's all kinds of like small vehicles people buy Hyundai venue. You know, it's, it's not like we only have pickup trucks and large SUVs here. You know, there are smaller vehicles on sale here, but. For whatever reason, Volkswagen is not interested in selling like electric versions of them, or the group at least. Yes, because that I think Volkswagen also makes the ID3 sold in Europe, not sold there. Um, right. So, uh, what else we want to talk about? Oh yeah. So also in the news this week, uh, not really f super up on this news, but maybe Tom, maybe you know more about it. The BMW Vision New Class X was rolled out this week by. Uh, BMW, this is not a car for sale that anyone can drive. Uh, it's more, they, they rolled it like a sedan, new class sedan last year, right? So it's a, a bit of an update on their styling. And as you can see in the picture here, it's got the, the kidney grill, but it's like a, a throwback to like the 70s kidney grill to me. It looks like, I don't know. <laughs> what, do you, what do you know about new class, Tom? I, I honestly, I don't know a lot about it. I read BMW blogs, articles. There's not a whole lot of like technical information yet. Uh, I do like that. Um, the new front grill, I think they're, they're, uh, um, they realized, I think the public has spoken and, and how they just kept making that freaking kidney grill bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. Um, and, uh, I, I think that, um, uh, shrinking it down a little bit is, uh, is, is reasonable. You know, this is obviously, you know, a, a concept, but, um, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to see the IX in concept form before the public did. Okay. And um, it was very similar to this, like in that um, the styling, the inside and how they present it. And then when the IX came to market, it really was the same vehicle, except no longer concept -y, like the interior was normal and, you know, not as wide. You look at the interior on this, it looks gorgeous and it's spacious and everything, but then, you know, you, you can't fit in all the bits that you need to fit in and, and, and for safety certification and all that, you know, that you have to change things around. So I, I, I do expect it to look very similar to this shape wise, you know, it just have a little bit um, more production feel to it. Uh, and I, I'd imagine this is kind of like IX three ish size, right? Maybe slightly bigger. Um, we we have we never got the IX three here, which is a shame. No. Um, this the 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 i the uh, X three sells really well here in in North America, and I was looking forward to the IX three. I actually was thinking about getting it as a a, a um, replacement for their BMW for the BMW i three, which I had at the time. 
uh, and then they didn't bring it, so I, I left the brand. Uh, something of this size, I think, would 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 translate well here if BMW can uh, offer it at a reasonable price. And they did talk a lot about pricing, I think, as far as the cost of their with, with this next generation of EVs, that the cost of their EVs are going to come down a little bit. At the same time, the cost of their ICE vehicles are, are going to go up a little bit. Um, so I think they're looking at trying to get that Delta closer that, you know, that, that, so that, um, cause that's going to really, until we get, uh, MSRP prices equal, it, we're not going to, we're, we're still going to struggle to, to get more EVs on the road because people go to dealerships and they just look at that MSRP. Yeah. They can't do the math on total cost of ownership, which is what you really have to do. And there's such a big Delta right now between, you know, I mean, you look at, you know, a BMW X5 and then look at an IX and, you know, people go to the dealership and go, yeah, but it's 15 grand more, you know, right. uh, that's that's out of my price range. They can't. And the dealerships aren't helping to say, well, wait a minute, let's sit down. Let's talk about incentives. Let's talk mm -hmm. about the cost of fueling. Let's, you know, let's put it all together. Today. And you know what? At the end of three years, you're actually ahead with this car. That's a better, more expensive car. But the dealers can't do that. They just right. can't. No matter how hard we try, I've tried to train them. I've worked with hundreds of dealerships on this. I made it very simple. And then you'd go back a month later. It's like, where's all that information I gave you? Oh, I think it's in a, 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 a shelf over there or something. They're not even using it. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. But um, hopefully that BMW is on target with uh, – getting that price closer to comparable ICE vehicles. Once that happens, it's game over, in my opinion, because they're just better vehicles. Um, right. So that's my thought on this. Yeah, no, price seems like really everything, you know, as we watch like adoption go. So, you know, we get the early adopters who say, who want maybe to go electric for environmental benefits and other people, you know, find out about them and like the uh, the performance aspects of them uh, or the just like the quiet, this is a totally different experience that you get and I, I i feel like it's a it's an experience that's worth more than a combustion vehicle but i guess it's maybe hard it's hard to sell that right if well you can't not. sell it unless you get, get get i mean we always talked about butts and seats right. i think if, if some if a dealership really wanted to sell evs you know do and bmw did this when they first launched the i3 and part of it was at my um I don't say demands, but like I was very forcefully telling you, you have to do this. Nobody is going to buy this weird, funky look, little looking little car if right. they can't experience what it's like. And they did the extended drive program here in the U.S., which was come pick up your an I3 on Friday and don't bring it back till Monday. And um, they gave people a whole weekend to live with it. That's, you, you, you know, you, what you approach. just talked about, Tom, is great and true. But how do you get people to experience it? They're not experiencing it with a with a 15 minute test drive, you know, on a loop to the next exit, turn around, come back to the dealership. They they have to sit there and um and and sit in the vehicle, see it in their garage, you know, even plug in a level one charger to to see how you do this, and and that's how they sell it. But I, I like this vehicle. I love that side view. I think it's a, I think it has a great great like kind of muscular stance i know it's going to look a little different in production but um right. that would be something i would get yeah i'm not i'm not so uh, you know so i'm a big fan of the bmw ix like its appearance i don't mind like the big grill like i think i, I like that bmw leaned into it <laughs> even yeah. like it did to make a statement i'm surprised it hasn't uh, taken off quite as much as i i don't know i think i haven't really looked at the overall sales numbers but i just thought it might be almost like ubiquitous in, in certain parts of town, you know, like just cause it's yeah. such people can see it and they know what it is, you know, that's. Yeah. And let, let me pull up a comment if you don't mind. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, Brad mentioned that, but dealers make a ton of cash on service and they do. Um, and, but what I can tell you, Brad is honestly, I, I, I've said this a hundred times on the show. I've worked with so many dealers. I've literally went in, hundreds of dealerships, at least 300 dealerships. I physically went in, talked to ownership, talked to general managers. And we and, and I've always brought this up. And I can tell you something, an extraordinarily small percentage of them even cared about that because they they their opinion was not enough. These things are going to break just like ICE cars are. And you know what? The simple service stuff, 
that we make a lot of money on, brake jobs, oil changes, things like that, they're not bringing their cars to the dealership. They're going to the local shop that charges less than we do. So the, the, the dealers, believe it or not, are not concerned about this service. And, and I, this is firsthand. I'm not speculating this. I've sat down in meetings with hundreds of dealer principals over, over seven or eight years. Um, and, and another thing about that, the salespeople are the ones that are really responsible for selling EVs. They couldn't care less if the dealership makes a penny on service. They are just there to sell a vehicle and get a commission. And if the EV is a harder sale, they're going to push it to the side mm -hmm. and push what's an easy sale for them, what they understand when right. they can answer the question. So everybody talks about how, yeah, dealers don't want to sell cars because they're not going to make they're not going to make money on service. That is a misnomer. That is incorrect. And and I might be one of the only people in the country that actually has proven data and information on that, that has spoken to the dealer principals, that has talked to them. And, you know, when Ford did this whole thing with, uh, with uh, saying that they were going to have Model E direct sales and set pricing and everything, Ford invited me to their annual dealer conference. There was only, I think, two journalists in this whole conference. And there was like a thousand dealer principals and, and, uh, and, and general managers and everything. And I actually mentioned that in a big public meeting that we had and everybody just was like, nah, we're not worried about that. These things are going to break just like gas cars and we'll, we'll, we'll have to repair them. We'll make more money fixing batteries and, 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 th and, and the battery management systems and computers than we even make on the ice car. So Everybody talks about how that's a big impediment. It is false. That is not an impediment. Right. Cool. Thank you for that, Tom. And the uh, rant. Right. And rant. Um, man, we haven't heard a good rant from Martin yet today. I don't know. We got any Toyota news in this list? I don't Hopefully not. <laughs> my gosh, my blood pressure. <laughs> but we do have some news about uh, Fisker this week. Uh, its troubles continue, and this week it announced that it's hitting pause on production, ostensibly for six weeks, and it intends to raise another $150 million. Of course, the Fisker Ocean is built by Magna in Austria. So Fisker delivered 1,300 vehicles last year, and this year Magna has built another 1,000 of them. I'm not sure how many of those have been delivered, but... Man, this, this company is in trouble. We talked about a little bit about this uh, last week, but things have gone to, from bad to worse. Man, I, I expect somebody's going to buy this place up. I forget they have like a, I think they have like a couple hundred million dollars in cash and and, and different uh, different things, but the, the the cap the what do you call the market cap is only like. 75 million or something like the share price of all the shares the value of all the shares put together is like 75 uh 750 million dollars i believe it, no 700 no it was like 75 million dollars it was like not a lot <laughs> like in this grand scheme of things it was like someone it was in into like the fiscal design could snap this company up i think i don't know um I know, but you have any thoughts on Fisker this week for us, Tom? Yeah, I don't know if anybody is interested in snapping them up. I think it's yeah. a cool vehicle. Um, but what tech do they have that's that's you know proprietary and 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 advanced and better? Um, you know, they don't have any factory, they don't have like a factory they spent a billion dollars on to build out where a manufacturer can go in and retool it and start building. They're using Magna. A lot of the tech in that is Magna design. Right, right. So what is Fisker? Design, basically. It's design. Right? I mean, that's... Let them go out of business and then hire Hamrick as a designer. <laughs> that's that's what, you know, that's what, kind of what I expect could happen. Because so, yeah. I, 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 I mean, that's what I think should happen personally. The only thing I could see is a Chinese company, you know, coming up and gobbling them up for a really small amount of money. Yeah. You know, really leaning on Henrik and getting incredibly favorable, um, you know, you know, if Henrik doesn't want to let go, if he doesn't want his Fisker brand to die, you know, they could really lean on him and say, we're your only option. Take it or leave it. We'll keep you on as as, you know, president or, or something like that and let you design the next car. But, um, you know, we'll uh, and Fisker will live on, you know, as we'll keep your name and everything. But um, here's here's, you know, 
you know, five cents on the dollar for what we think it's worth, take it or leave it. Right. Uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, well, at this price, it would be a, a, an incredible bargain. I like that idea you had there, but like a Chinese company coming in and helping it gain a, like a foothold in the market here. That'd be a, a kind of an interesting opening move for, for somebody out there. Uh, it sucks that it leaves so many owners though in the lurch, you know, I don't, I'm not sure what can be done to help them. You know, there's so many people out there who have like some issues and, you know, the, the, the uh, Fisker service hasn't really been, you know, addressing people enough. So like in owners groups, at least, you know, people are concerned, obviously, you know, they spend a lot of money on this car and while some of them are having the great experiences, some of them are not, you know, so uh, yeah. Do you have many over there in the UK, Martin? No, uh, they're is meant it? to be meant to be buying, uh, meant to be selling a load of them to a company called Onto, which is an EV subscription company. But they went bust last year into administration. I think they're being run as a going concern. So um, they uh, they've not got that deal. Um, I've not seen any right hand drive versions. Had a good friend actually had a Fisker reservation uh, and cancelled it. Got his money back within about a week. So they didn't uh, delay with that. But um, I think he dodged a bullet. Yeah, I kind of kind of think so. I mean, man, I just I hate seeing people stuck with, you know, vehicles with no support. So I'm, I'm something's got to happen though, right? Basically to help these people out. I'm not sure uh <laughs> what help they can get. Uh the Fisker owners uh because mm -hmm. they 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 took they took a risk mm -hmm. uh on True. on buying a Fisker. So mm -hmm. at some point I think you have to do some adulting and say uh, you can't expect to be bailed out from decisions you make because, and I'm not, and, and I, these are, these are, these are good human beings. I'm, I'm not, I'm not being horrible to them, but, um, right. you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, well, we bought the Polestar a couple of months ago and that's backed by Geely and it's part of Volvo and, but it's essentially a new brand and sure. it's a new Chinese brand essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. This is not the same as using a Google product where Google turn around and go, yeah, we're stopping that now. Uh, and that sucks because this is your own hard-earned money on a piece of hardware. But you, di if Tesla hadn't made it, those early Tesla owners ten years ago um, would have uh, feel felt equally aggrieved and every right to be. But uh, at least that was bigger than Fisker. You know, if Fisker doesn't make it, there's not really an incentive for third-party body shops, third-party manufacturers, you know, factor makers to. Uh, produce spares for these cars because there's, it's such a small addressable audience and so i really feel for those people but they took a risk um will nissan buy fisker <laughs> they might do i mean gm said they were going to make the nicola badger and we all looked around and went did anybody on the board do their due diligence like we all can tell that's a scam yeah, <laughs> like <yeah. laughs> hey trevor's going to be in prison one day fast forward right. uh and, right. and 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 meanwhile gm who are as big as they get being like Hey, us plus Nicola. It's going to be a great partnership. Meanwhile, all of us and the audience went, are you crazy? Right. So will yeah, Nissan buy? Like, and no one's lost their jobs over that as far as I know. Not that I want people to lose their jobs, but come on. That was a on. weird moment in time. Woo! Sure. That's a, a weird moment <laughs> in automotive history. Uh, 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 will Nissan buy or invest or offer their dealerships as an outlet? I mean, they could do. Weirder things have happened, but uh, they shouldn't because there's, I, there's nothing. Unless there's some secret source in Fisker that none of us know about. Right. Unlikely. Right. Why would why would Nissan spend their money uh, on this? Um, God, well, it's pretty. It, 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 oh. You know, they, they would get used to the platform. No, but I that's guess. Magna. Yeah. Like a, a lot of the technology, which is the weird sure. thing, because Magna know right. how to build a car. They build the G class. Like they can build a G wagon that's bulletproof. So I don't think you can point your finger at them to say you can't. A lot of this is software. So the. Two things happened. Marcus Brownlee, whether you watch MKBHD or not, that's now 2 million views on his video. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's more. It's like four and a half, five million 5 million yeah. on the worst car he's ever reviewed. That was the title of the video. And then right. this week, Consumer Reports did their... They bought it. Mm -hmm. $64,000 they spent on... Is it called Ultra Trim? Um, and just tore it apart and said... Um, you know, for a whole day, the brake failure light was on. And the next day, it just went out. And, like, there's no adaptive cruise control. And the regen is so bad, it made our passengers, what you know, what, were nauseous. And, and uh, they just, uh, they had some positives to say, but Consumer okay. Reports are not there to blow smoke. And it, it was ripped apart. And right. when that happens, you have to, 
I've not driven a Fisker, so I have to read those publications, and I don't always agree. I've seen them write pretty bad things about Tesla yeah, in I've, the past. I've disagreed but with the, consumer the, I've reports. Disagreed with consumer reports. Yeah. No, you've got that wrong. I'm very familiar with Tesla, and that's wrong. Um, but I'll go with that. I'll go with go with MKBHD and 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 his and, and Marquez's channel, and uh, it and actually the owners online on the forums uh, are criticizing the vehicle but they've spent their own money on it so they're, they're, they're a bit you know we had, Kyle, we, we had kyle on earlier who's like yeah it doesn't yeah. have you know autopilot and it's and it's this and that and the cyber truck tonneau cover overheats after a couple of uses and it's terrible and he and he loves the vehicle that which is understandable because it's got mm -hmm. redeeming features um right. but even the fisker owners are like come on this is not good enough consumer reports had version software 2.0 which is meant to oh. fix everything um, right and by the look of it it didn't so right um, you feel you feel for Fisker and anyone anyone working there really. Um, I hope they're going to be okay. Anyone that bought the car, I hope they're going to be okay. But th there's not a lot left in this at the minute. It's look, selling cars is brutal. Selling EVs is brutal. The way that China, the way that China did it was they opened the floodgates eight ten years ago. Had thousands of EV companies. Yeah, and who do we talk? Bunch. Who do we talk about now? BYD, Neo, Xpeng. Yeah, Xpeng. Not a done deal. Lee, um, uh, a little bit. Uh, Lee, not a done deal. I mean, work to do there. Xpeng, work to do there. Mm -hmm. um, and hundreds have gone by the wayside that we never hear about because right. that it was China went down the route of natural selection. Of we'll open the doors, we'll encourage lots of startups, right. and and the and the cream will rise to the top, um, right. which is <laughs> it's brutal, isn't it? Uh, you know, you've got Sherry's owners. still holding in there, you know. Yeah, but you got owners out there who spent their own money on cars that can't get service and and you know things like connectivity and things like that. Uh, what was the upmarket brand that uh, issued the warning this week in China? Hi-Fi, Hi-Fi, like oh, those, cool, right. those, yeah. Hi those cars was... are really cool. And the CEO yeah. being like, "Hey, we're going to have to switch off the 4G, whatever is 5G connection. Um, hopefully, our you know the owners are going to be okay. But sorry, got to close the doors." And five minutes ago, they were releasing new models, and it was all guns blazing. So this is. Right. This is not unheard of, is what I'm trying to say. So if anyone thinks, "Wow, my goodness, a car brand going," you know, Fisker can't possibly go. They can very easily. They have before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. but humans are affected, and we and, and obviously we feel for those right. people. Right. Yeah. No, it, it is it is hard to read some of the comments sometimes. Yeah, I, I tried to rent one to do uh, some testing, range testing, charging testing. It one popped up on uh, Toro right by my, right where I live, and. Uh, so I look at it and I didn't reserve a date. I'm like, okay, I think I'll do this on Monday. And it was like on a Wednesday. And I'm like, I'll reserve it over the weekend because it's probably like not even on anyone's radar. No one's renting it. So on Saturday now, three days later, I, I log on to, to to rent it for Monday. And it's been removed because it was broken. It oh, said, oh. you know, vehicle is, it needs service. So I was like, three days after it, 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 it the guy got it. He'd already needed service. So it's, it's unfortunate, but um, it seems to be the case uh, that, that they released a vehicle that wasn't fully baked and, uh, you know, probably needed another six months of, uh, of, of, of finishing. And they probably couldn't, you know, Fisker probably was going to run out of money or, mm -hmm. you know, had made promises to, on delivery dates and stuff. And they, and they just, they had to push the car out and they said, we'll, we'll, we'll do OTA updates. We'll, We'll work. Then we'll do the Tesla thing. Get a car out before it's fully baked, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll get it working right after a few months. And uh, they, it looks like they ran out of money before they can uh, get everything working. Right. I think I think they eventually would have if, if they had endless pockets. You know, if, yeah. if if a Chinese you know company were to come in now and say, "Oh, here we'll we'll throw a billion dollars in in your account, get this thing fixed." Yeah, it probably would, but. That would go a long way toward getting things rolling properly for sure. Well, they did. They did secure another hundred and fifty million of funding, I think, recently, or maybe yeah. I, I maybe that's I'm wrong. That's what they're working on. That's what they're trying to secure. Yeah. But that's not a whole lot of money, that's right? That's not a whole like lot nothing. of money in a car business. One hundred and fifty no. million. And that's crazy yeah. to say, but that's why we don't have so many successful car companies. It's brutally expensive. I mean, the yeah. billions. Elon talked billions. about this a lot years ago. Mm. You know how how he just kept pour another hundred million, another three hundred million, another four hundred million, and you know, the Tesla engineers are saying, we're just about there. We're just about there. And this was for the, the Roadster and how it just, it was, it, it almost broke Elon. You know, it did break him at one point. He had run out of money, Elon. 
And um and and you know that's when they you know kind of he got lucky and turned turned it around. I've heard him. I was at an event, a small event with Elon, and and he was telling us the what had happened, and he was just like every time I turned around, they were like, we need another hundred million, and he goes, you know, at first when when I signed on, they told me fifty five more million, and the and the roadster would be done. <laughs> and he goes, here I am, five hundred million later, and we're nowhere as near being done. So I mean that's. That, that's that's why we don't have you know hundreds of car companies out there it's a brutal business to break into right all right uh we just have uh, just one more story i think to talk about really um is that's the world premiere of the new id buzz gtx with four motion all-wheel drive i was like so, so last week we had a spicy gtx uh what was that id3 and something else we don't get here in europe right Martin ID seven with the two GTXs, right? And we're not. Are we going to get? And I don't think we're going to get the ID X, ID seven or, jeez, all these letters, <laughs> ID seven GTX. I don't think it's coming to the US, right? Or it is not I in the tour. Think. They showed it in the tour in the station wagon, which we won't. Oh get. no, you won't get the station wagon, but you'll get the ID seven. Right, right, but not a GTX ID seven. No. And it looks like so. I got all excited about this spicy. Uh, ID buzz, like the bus, basically a long wheelbase coming to the U S but it's not the spicy. The GTX is also just staying in Europe, apparently. Well, yes and no. It's pretty oh, really? interesting what they've done with this. Okay. So let me, let me, let me quickly explain. Yeah. So long wheelbase versions coming to the U S and they've, so what they've done is they've put the big AP 550 motor on the rear axle of the ID buzz mm -hmm. and they've put an 80, horsepower maybe 120 horsepower motor on the front that'll be disconnected most of the time it'll it'll cut in when you need the traction um so that gives the id buzz all-wheel drive and they've given it a bigger battery which is 86 kilowatt hours and that's the one that you get what you don't get is it won't be branded gtx so the volkswagen of america decision not to import the gtx well three letters is interesting because you'll get the buzz with all the good stuff, but it won't be called a GTX and it won't have red stitching on the steering wheel and it won't have you know red stitching on the seats and uh, the little kind of black detailing. I've got a picture somewhere. Um, uh, maybe there's some more on this page. Uh, you know, the dual okay. colors, the little black GTX branding. Ooh. But essentially, mechanically, from what I gather, you will get the, uh, you will get it. It'll just be, it's, they're going to use AWD. They'll call it the Buzz All Wheel Drive, not the Buzz GTX. So, uh, but I was a bit confused by it, and I kind of reread it several times on the press release, and I think I get it. But um, odd that Volkswagen of America is not having GTXs, uh, that you're calling it, or, or that this won't be the Buzz GTX. I can't definitively say they'll never have a GTX car. But initially, for now, it'll be Buzz All Wheel Drive, it'll be the GTX. Um, but um, I think it's cool. I mean, it's a quick minivan. Um, and I just think some recalibration is needed. Sorry. I think some recalibration is needed on what GTX is as well. Because for sure. so long in my head, GTX meant GTI. So the ID3 GTX was a, a Golf GTI, which is a hot hatchback and, and fun and giggles and smiles. And okay, you know, the electric one is rear wheel drive, not front wheel drive. Some would say that's better, but it's not pure GTI, I guess. And um, I thought that's what GTX meant. So GTX minivan seems weird. But it's not, if you just think of it as, well, it's adding a dual motor, it's adding all-wheel drive, it's adding more power, and uh, the short wheelbase version, which we get a choice of, gets the bigger battery that's going in the ID3 that charges it. Again, this is weird. The bigger battery, 2 kilowatt hours bigger, 79 kilowatt hour, charges at 175 kilowatts peak in the ID3 GTX, which we told you about last week. But 185 kilowatts in the Buzz GTX. So maybe it's not the same battery. Anyway, and it gets the long wheelbase version gets the bigger battery. Five or seven seat options for Europe, just the seven seat option for the US. Uh, it's weird, isn't it, how it changes market to market. But you will essentially get mechanically this vehicle. Okay. Well, that, that makes me feel better then because, I, you know, I, I love the buzz and... I you know in you know, a little bit of spices you know I can't say no to, to a little bit of spice you know I don't <laughs> you know what's what's the uh, zero to sixty on this do you know six what's point six something okay so not maybe six point but, five but plenty quick for uh, plenty quick compared especially compared to anything that's you know gas powered really in this kind of uh, uh, vehicle part of the market minivan or, or van right 
yeah i think to have that performance in a minivan is cool and uh and probably on some surfaces all wheel drive would be useful um i'd probably just have the bigger motor on the rear axle and have a bit more efficiency but they're saying that the front motor won't be connected um most of the time unless you need it under yeah. either extreme acceleration or um you know loose loose underfoot and you need the you need the four all-wheel drive so not a permanent all-wheel drive system which seems like a good compromise um and uh, but but i think no date was put on the u.s release of this uh they just want to get it out in your market in its its standard form with the big battery and, and the and the long wheelbase we expect this to come this year though right Tom? yeah by the end of the or year by the end of the year right this year okay. but made over here so right. there was lots of talk over do you make it in chattanooga or not but they announced this week i think it's going to be made in made in germany and exported so we won't or maybe it was last week they announced that but it won't get the uh federal tax credit not sure it would have right. done if they would built it in the u.s because of the battery components but i uh, just lease it yeah maybe through leasing you can get the uh, tax credit for it but all right well i think that brings us to the end of our show if you have any questions or comments, uh, please leave them below or get in touch with us on the social media platform of your choice. Uh, if you click subscribe, tap that bell icon for notifications. Uh, don't forget, if you like the show, please give us a thumbs up. Thumbs up. Um, right. Thank you all very much for joining us again. It's been great hanging out with you all. And we'll see you again very soon.